teach about is the alignment part of prayer. There's something called alignment. And the premise from whence alignment begins is your heart. But stay with me. Once upon a time in northern Nigeria, there's a city called Zaria. And I met this young man while I was ministering. He took a liking to my administration and he decided to secure an appointment with me. And so I obliged and I accepted him to come talk with me. And he said he wants to tell me a strange thing. I told him I like strange things. He said when he was a young lad in the village, he went to the stream. You know, in our typical village settings, uh, you don't have pipe bone water running through the pumps. You need to get water from the stream, from the river. So he was going to the riverside to get water. And then the spirit now hops out of the river and suspends in the air and tells him, we've been looking for you. We want to give you wisdom so that you can help your community. So are you interested in this wisdom? He said, yes. Me too, I'm, I've been looking for wisdom. So the spirit gave him alligator pepper. Do you know alligator pepper? Um, where's James? What's the closest relative to alligator pepper? Chili. You know, scotch what? Now, nah, please. Scotch bonnet. All right, so that thing he said. <laughs> Gave him three copies of, of that thing. Chili. Very hot chili. I mean, the hottest chili you can ever find. And it, it will interest you to know that the strength of pepper, chili, is not in the size. Mm, you can have. Alligator pepper is very slim, but <laughs> quite potent. So he gave him three copies of it. Now, the guy is in the, in the flesh. When he takes the chili, then he will, he, will, he will go high. And he's in that state, he can communicate to him. The lecture began, and the spirit ensured that no one came to the stream to get water at, during the course of the lecture. Part of the things the spirit taught him was how to set a coordinate, what we call the shrine. I know you don't know what a shrine is. But a shrine is a place where a spiritual thing is trapped in the natural realm. So that if you want to touch that spiritual thing, you go to that location. You can have encounter with that spiritual thing. You see, so this shrine is set up with the technology. And the technology is um, setting up the coordinates of the place consistent with the dimension that the spirit exists. Am I making sense? So that if you do that, because if we go back to First Kings chapter 6 and you see the way the temple was constructed, you will see that the temple was constructed to capture the offices of men, capture the offices of angels, to capture the offices of cherubims, and to capture the office of God. And the implication is that God can actually move from his invincible realm and come into that place and not know he has changed realm because that physical place was set up to mirror his dimension. Are you there? All right, so see, in the Holy of Holies, you will see two cherubims. And their wings are stretched forth. They call them the covering cherubs. And if you check your Bible in the book of Ezekiel chapter 28, one of the covering cherubs happened to be Lucifer. We don't know the name of the second one, but we know one. And that's the highest service an angel can render in the courts of heaven, to be a covering cherub. So in the angelic world, in terms of rank, Lucifer was one of the highest angels in the angelic order. Are you with me? You see, that Holy of Holies was built to capture the dimension of cherubims. Because if a priest is coming to minister there, that priest needs to be protected from Shekinah. Are you with me? Shekinah can, it doesn't have compatibility with flesh, with mortality. So every high priest that enters into the Holy of Holies, he does so in the peril of his life. And part of the reason why that cherub must be stationed is to protect the minister from Shekinah illumination. So that's the realm in which Satan once served in the corridors of heaven. So he knows one, a thing or two about glory, about... <laughs> Hallelujah. Are you with me? Because of that, he can... He can mimic many things that he saw in heaven. It is in keeping with his experience and exposure that he empowers witches to set up altars to govern territories. And so that's how the, the temple was constructed. So that angels can come into the temple and they don't know they are, they are on earth because their dimensions were captured in the construction. 
So you understand what happened to, uh, was it Zachariah? Zachariah in the book of Luke chapter 1. He came to offer up incense, to burn the incense in the presence of God. And then Gabriel now stood by the altar of incense and was speaking with him. Are you with me? Zachariah was in the presence of God, but he was not aware of the fact that the temple was built to capture angelic dimensions. So when he saw the angel, he was... Meanwhile, the angel was at home because the environment was built to capture, anticipated that his dimension will be found within that building. And um, Angel Gabriel was telling Zachariah that I am Gabriel that stands in the presence of God. Are you with me? Do you realize, where was Zachariah? Presence of God. But see, there was a dimension of the presence of God that Gabriel knew that Zachariah did not know. Even though they were all in the presence of God. The difference between the realms they operated was, was, was occasioned by the light that was in that realm. Because if you operated from the outer court, your light is sunlight. If you operated from the holy place, your light is a candle light. If you operated from the holy of holies, your light is Shekinah illumination. And the things you will see with Shekinah is different from the things you will see with candlelight. Different from the things you will see with sunlight. And even if you see the same thing from sunlight, it will be different. If it's under candlelight, it will be different if it's under Shekinah illumination. Because those are different realms captured in the same building. Are you with me? So that spirit taught this young man how to build a shrine that captures its dimension so that if he knows what to do and to set the coordinates right, the spirit can actually come and visit him and give him instructions and give him wisdom. And that's how he became a very powerful man. And he began to solve human problems. People began to resort to him. Until that day when we met, he was tired of carrying the body of that priesthood and he wanted to be released from it. So the way Israel settled was consistent to set several patterns that were mirrored from the spirit realm. Because those patterns were mirrored, the presence of God covered them literally. And he made it impossible for the sorcerer to inflict a curse. So, the word he said, orbit. So their, their alignment was over and against the ark, which was the center of the pattern. So you want to be a carrier of the presence of God. First of all, Christ must be the center and the circumference of your existence because he is the center he is the extent and the limit of divine revelation everything that God wants to do in your life and with your life is going to come through the administration that have been set up in Christ in the spirit you're not with me am I maybe I'm supposed to change the scripture now if you come to Nigeria come to Africa the major theme of what we preach is around prosperity but obviously everybody is prospering here in uh, so that's not a universal revelation. It is, it's not a universal revelation. So that's not what God is pushing across the nations. It, it can be relevant in some places and totally irrelevant in others. But every believer needs to know how to angulate his heart to Christ Jesus. The Bible reveals, are you with me? All right. How many of us still remember the great confession of Peter? When Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter said two things. He said, thou art the Christ. What's the meaning of that? No, no, wait, wait, don't, don't go too far. Let's start with Christ. Thou art the Christ. What's the meaning of that? What? Okay, anointed one. What's the meaning of that? What's the meaning of anointed one? Okay, let me help you. When we talk about the Christ, we're talking about a ministry. We're talking about an office in the realm of the spirit. When we talk about the Christ, we're talking about one that has been raised to administer the processes and the protocol of the divine life in your spirit. You are born again today and you remain born again because of a ministry that is set up in the heavens. He ministers life to you. He sustains you in that partnership wherein you partake of the divine nature. It's because of him. That you are held up as a Christian. It's because of his priesthood in the heavens above that you can pray and know by the Spirit of God that God has answered your prayer. It is because his office furnished that knowing in your heart. So when we talk about the Christ, we're talking about an administrative office that is set up to manage our destinies. The context in which the Father, oh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
stay with me. I want to show you a broad, very broad spiritual context before we begin to talk about prayer. There's an infrastructure in the realm that you must be acquainted with. There is a dimension that your heart must mirror so that you'll be in the first field of the harmony of the Spirit of God. Because many people pray and they don't encounter God. Many people fast and to them the fasting was futile. The reason is because we need to know how to align with that office. There's an office in the spirit that your heart must align with. Everything that God wants to do in your life is going to come through the administration that is in that office. Are you still with me? Can we, can we, can we do 1 Corinthians chapter 1? Show you just something and then we'll proceed. First Corinthians 1 verse 30. Who is there? He said, but of him. The him there is the father. So you can substitute him with the father. And say, but of the father are ye in Christ Jesus. There is a context in which the father has domiciled you to manage you. The father has placed you in Christ Jesus under the administration that is managed by the Christ. That's where he put you. That's where the Father intends to manage your life, manage your destiny, manage everything that you need for life and godliness. He puts you in Christ Jesus. That is the administrative context wherein God will manage your life. Are you here? All right, see. So of him, of the Father, are ye in Christ Jesus. And if you study the New Testament, you'll find, sometimes you'll find Christ Jesus. Other times you find Jesus Christ. Other times you find Christ. It's not the same thing. When Christ comes before Jesus, the emphasis is the office, the administration. When Jesus comes before Christ, the emphasis is the person because the, the revelation that Peter gave is twofold. Thou art they, Christ, referring to the office, the ministry. Thou art they, son of the living God, referring to the person. And uh, Jesus being the son of the living God is the definition of God. The clearest definition of God you find in, in in the Gospels you find people saying this woman was caught in the act of adultery according to the law of Moses she should be stoned to death but what do you say it means it may seem that the law is not very clear as to how to administer these things we need your opinion because when he was physically present God had an opinion God could give clarity to the position of the law that was hazy are you, are you with me he clearly brought the perspective of God. The way that scripture was going to, was going to be in, in implemented, because the guys brought a woman caught in adultery. Where is the man? The man escaped. And they, they claim that it's justice that they want to implement. It was obvious that in that arrangement, the only person that had legitimacy to implement that stroke of justice was Jesus himself. So first of all, he filtered the law enforcement agents by saying, if there is anyone among you that has no sin, let him cast the first one. Suddenly, the law enforcement agents now discovered that in the light of what they wanted to implement, they didn't have the stature to do it. And only Jesus was the only one that had the stature to implement that judgment. And Jesus decided to show her mercy, not because he violated justice, but because two days after that time, he'll be going to the cross to pay the price for justice. And that is the basis of the mercy that he gave the world. Are you still with me? So when we talk about Christ Jesus, the emphasis is the office. So the Bible is saying that you were deposited under the surveillance of an office that is established in the spirit that is managed by Jesus. Does it make sense? Ah, you are not with me. I'm trying to show you the inner chamber of prayer. Because many of us pray from the outer court. You don't know that what you are doing is feeding an administration with a desire that is consistent with the will of God. That's the only thing that makes your prayer acceptable in the heavens above. That administration picks up what you have uttered and converts it to immortal language. Because by the time you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 6 to 8, you will find out that prayer doesn't ascend into God's chamber in words, in English. It ascends as incense. That's immortal language. It's in that form that your, pray your prayers are perceived. And, if each and every one of us has a unique fragrance. And when that fragrance begins to ascend, God can smell and know this is Matt Williams. 
because I know his fragrance in the spirit. It's unique fragrance. That office must convert it to a form that immortals can understand. You don't believe me? Since you don't believe me, I will, I will change my scriptures. <laughs> Hallelujah. He says, of him are ye in Christ Jesus. And this Christ Jesus, he said, God the Father has made this Christ Jesus, what? Wisdom unto us. Has made him righteousness unto us. Has made him sanctification unto us. Has made him redemption unto us. Do you know the meaning of that? And that list is not exclusive. It's not exhaustive. Have you heard the psalmist say, the Lord is my light and my salvation? Because that list is not exhaustive. If you are placed under that administration that is managed by Jesus, Jesus through that administration can become everything you need to prosecute your divine purpose and to live for God upon the face of the earth. He, he can become wisdom to you because you need direction. And the profit that is in wisdom is in his ability to give direction. For the Bible says wisdom is profitable to When you function from that administration, he can become light to you to give you insight into your current situation so that you will know what to do. You will know when to stand, know when to sit, know when to walk away. And like Joseph, you will know when to run. So the design is that God, according to the book of Colossians, designed that this office of the Christ is, is, is expected to be preeminent in the life of the believer. That's God's eternal plan that that office will be the basis of our civilization. I think, should we go there, Colossians chapter 1, so that you can see the sequence? And then you will now know that everything we do is supposed to be within that context. Just like the ark was an inevitable requirement around the civilization of the children of Israel, there is an office under which we have been kept. And all of our activities are supposed to be drawn from the power that that office makes available. Is that clear? Come to, come, 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 come to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. This is the theory. When we finish the theoretical side, we'll move into the practical side. You will see the visible office of the Christ manifest here. And uh, you don't need to believe. Your faith is not needed. What will be happening will be based on the sovereignty of God. Hallelujah. Colossians 1, who is there with me? Verse 12 says, Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet or qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood. That's Jesus. Are you with me? He's talking about Jesus now. It is in him we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins still talking about jesus who is the image of the invincible god the firstborn of every creature for by him were all things created that are in heaven that are in earth visible and invincible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers or things all things were created by him and for him he is before all things and by him all things consist and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead. Why? Why is he? He is everything. Why? So that in all things, are you there? Yes. He might have what? Preeminence. Preeminence. That's the design. That's the eternal design of God. The reason why is Jesus that came to pay for your salvation is so that you'll be indebted to him. And in, by so doing, he will be preeminent. If you say, okay, I'm not in the body of Christ, the Bible says him that created all things, the invisible and the visible realm. Anything, everything in every realm is the author of it. And the, the reason why it was designed that way is so that him and the office that he administers should be preeminent. Just like the ark was in the heart of the civilization of their worship. This Christ and the office he administers is in the heart of our civilization, our citizens, of the kingdom of God. Exactly. The design is this that he should be what? Preeminent. Yeah. So there, before we begin prayer, there is an alignment requirement. The, the, the issue is this is he preeminent in your life? 
That is the extent. Of, that's how close or far away you are from the sun. Some people can be under intense heat because it's preeminent in their life. He's, he's the one that administers government over their life. The things that you find them doing, it came from him. These are instructions he gave and they are following, they are, they are prosecuting those instructions. You will find his glory on those people. They will know when things, when policies, new policies are released in the heavenlies because they are close to him. They are around the administration of our civilization. And there are some other guys that you know, they just come to church because we are Christians. They, you know, they are, they are participants in the Christian religion. So on Sunday morning, they have a bow tie and they sing hymns. <laughs> you might be minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit because you are so far away from the heart of our civilization. And that's what I got. The understanding I got from Moses. So where are you in the orbit? Are you Pluto? In the distant corridors of the outer court. And the impact of the blazing sun does not get to where you are. So there's coldness around your space. No heat, no fire. You have found a way to exist apart from the government of the Christ. So your life is a product of your wisdom. You don't need him in your circumference. But there are some men that can do nothing of themselves. But they want to hear his voice before they act. They want to see his face before they move. Those ones are living under the direct implication of his administration and his government is heavy upon their heart. When they cry, heaven, half of heaven can move to provide what is needed through that office to meet the need for which they cry. And that's the reason why our prayer ladders were on different frames of reference on the prayer ladder. Some people's prayer can liberate Manchester. Some others may pray for 20 years. And the demons will still hold. But tonight we wander under the canopy of his administration. We wander into that place where his voice is law. We go into that corridor where it is only by his spirit. Men rise. That's what the nations of the earth need. Men that are situated directly under the influence of his government. Of ye, of him are ye in Christ Jesus. And in that administrative ecosystem, he can make Christ Jesus to become everything you need just in case you begin to draw close and you find out that you don't have the capacity to sustain prayer. You desire to pray, but the ability to pray is not in you and you are in that struggle. Oh, then it means there is an aspect of Christ that you qualify to receive revelation about. Christ as the quickening spirit. Christ as the resurrection and the life. What the Bible says is the spirit that quickens it. Christ becomes the quickening spirit to make you alive so that you cannot breathe in such a way that you have vocabulary to communicate to God. In the realm of the spirit, we are totally incapacitated. I know you might be a professor in your field, highly respected in England, in the United Kingdom, but you know what? The fact that you are intelligent and you are revered as a scholar in your field does not give you any advantage in the spirit. In fact, you will need to die to your scholarship in order for your heart to be ready to receive help from God. Because the Bible says it's the spirit that quickens. The flesh, it profits nothing. Your prayer journey becomes an adventure of grace when you realize that you have infirmities. The Bible reveals that the spirit helps our infirmities. And infirmities is in the plural. It means there are many. I'm a bag of infirmities. And you know in, the, in, 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 in ancient English, the word infirmity is also the word for sickness. So according to the Bible, we are all sick. And we are badly sick with diverse infirmities. And only the Holy Ghost can cure us. It is the Spirit. It is Christ as the Spirit that administers cure to our insufficiencies and bring us to places where we can operate in the realm of God. So there is a system that is available in the Spirit. But as bogus, as mighty as that system is, it, it, it can elude you if your heart is not aligned to receive help. Before prayer becomes a, a practice, it is first a state of heart. An angulation that must be achieved over and against the influence of the governing canopy, which is the office of Christ. That's where 
the spirit is released from. That's where grace comes from. That's what we call the throne of grace. You know, you, you, may, you may have understood grace, but many of us do not understand that it is administered from a throne. There's an administration around grace. A throne that manages it. And so many believers are without grace. Without grace in many things. If you find grace, it means you have found Christ. You have found the administrator. He's the source of it. It's when he approves that he releases it through his spirit to begin to manifest in your life. And until you acknowledge that you are incapacitated, you are not a candidate for the Lord's help. You need to be helped to pray. You can gossip all night and describe people's head, that this head is big, and you describe it all night, but you will need grace to talk to a spirit. You can talk to men naturally, but only, it's only by grace you will talk to a spirit. So if you're going to move from the natural realm into the supernatural, you are going to need to salute a chieftain, and his name is Jesus, and he administers the office of the Christ. Your heart must know this. So when you are blowing away in prayer, it is because you are in search of the administrator. Until you find the grace he administers, you cannot mount up with wings like eagles. You will pray and still be in this hall, and someone else will pray and mount up into the heavens above. They will see his shape, because he will allow them to see through his spirit, and they will see his shape. He will allow them to hear through his spirit, so they will hear his voice. And prayer becomes an interaction. It becomes an adventure. It becomes something you want to give yourself to forever because you are exploring the realm of the merchandise of life. So Matt Williams was asking, in the orbit, where are you? With respect to the sun, are you in the cold places of Pluto? You can migrate tonight. My adventure in prayer began because of my impediment, my speech impediment. I was born with a terrible stammering infirmity. And I had an encounter with God and God revealed to me that I was born to be a preacher. And I was wondering how a preacher could be a stammerer because I could not speak. So God started my journey with an infirmity that I did not have the capacity. There was no drug, no injection I could take that could help my speech impediment. I needed God. So he helped me by allowing me to have a limitation that doctors could not help could not my parents counsel couldn't help i only needed god are you with me and when i pray he insists that i'm a preacher so one day i had time so all right let me find him and i lay on the altar fasting praying fasting then i had an encounter the scripture was was placed on my spirit man that was the beginning the christ was beginning to administer something and there was a wisdom that I had to know. So he laid the scripture upon my hand. He said, think through the scripture. Think through the scripture. Are you with me? Have you ever had the experience before you were just praying and the scripture just alights on your heart? Mm, you're already in interfacing with the administrator. There is a wisdom that you need that is captured in that scripture in order for you to penetrate. Oh, the moment you come into the first field of his influence, he begins to teach you because you need alignment. He needs to take you from where you are in the corridor and bring you under Shekinah illumination. So he, he reaches out and drops a scripture on your heart. For me, the scripture he dropped was, as for you, this is the covenant I have with you. I have put my words in your mouth. I said, oh. He has a covenant with me. That was revealing. And he, it is his responsibility to put his words in my mouth. Oh, that's great. So if he's the one putting the words in my mouth, it's no longer my responsibility to find out how to speak. He will, he will make sure I speak it. So I now realize that in order for me to preach, I need to go before him and, and find words from words. Once I get words from him, the ability to preach comes with the words he gives. And that's how I can preach on the pulpit. The symptoms of stammering will come back the moment I... So I know, I know... That there is an administrator that is stronger than my speech impediment. So there is no limitation that you have on your life right now that he doesn't have an administrative response to it. <laughs> Everything that the father wants to make available to you is under his hand in his administration. But first of all, you need to accept his government. The meaning of my life is what he says to me. That's life for me. I was telling some of our friends this morning, we were in a little Bible study session this morning. I was telling uh, our friends that I was in the oil industry in my country. 
And you need to be very intelligent and very, very favored for you to have the kind of job that I have. The oil industry accounts for 97% of our gross domestic product. And the kind of salary, we, the philosophy behind our payment system in Nigeria is that you are paid consistent to the performance of the industry that you find yourself. So being that the oil industry is the highest in the ladder, we were paid more than any other worker in the country. And I was good at what I did. I grew in the ranks. It was just two weeks to the time of the examination that will usher me into management cadre. And my Lord came and said, you need to drop your letter of resignation because it's time for you to be a full-blown missionary to take my counsel to the nations of the world. And I told him, I said, is it not to your glory for a manager to resign and say he wants to follow you? Just allow me sit there for one day and I'll drop. A manager. <laughs> and the reason why I was appealing the instruction was because if you, if you retire as a manager, the, your, your retirement package is, is large. It's massive. Jesus, you need a manager on your team. Say, I'm, oh, hallelujah. He said, now, you have to stop it. So the meaning of my life, in this stage of my life, is that he said I should resign and go to the nations of the world and proclaim his majesty. That is my preoccupation. Do you understand that? It is his throne that gives me essence, relevance, because the Bible says that he created, all things were created by him and for him. So you exist for him. Most of us are still existing for ourselves and that's why you are weak and powerless. That's why you are still in Pluto. Minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Some others have migrated. Some others like the fires of his presence and the impact of his government. When I left that place, my colleagues say, oh, the witches that have been looking for this boy, they have finally succeeded on his life. We always knew witches were looking for him. To, do, to bring injury to his destiny. Now we have confirmed it. And I didn't have any opportunity to explain. Imagine how it would look like among my family members. Imagine, imagine. And there were so many people that, were, that I was sponsoring to school. Those ones didn't have the courage to come and tell me that. How are we going to? <laughs> how are we going to manage their fears? I knew people didn't believe that Jesus spoke to me. But that was not relevant because it was Jesus that took me from the wilderness, from the backside of the wilderness, and he guided me. He spoke about the job on the 13th day of, when he sent, and that was the first time I saw an angel in my life. 13th day of uh, January 2003, he sent an angel to me at, at 11.45 p.m. Nigerian time. He said, you will not go into full-time ministry. I will give you a job, and you will invest in many destinies, and a great network will be formed. That was the day I received that. So I was investing in many destinies according to the instruction. And then he came again and said, I've come to set you free. 16th of August, 2019, I've come to set you free. So that where I am, there also will my servant be. So I had to ask him, am I bound? He said, your job is your bondage now. It is time for you to go to the nations of the world. And I'll send you to the United Kingdom. I'll send you to Ghana. And I'll send you to South Africa. I am here today. Because one of your sons came to us. I'm not a Pentecostal tongue-talking Christian because of Pentecost. I'm not a Pentecostal tongue-talking Christian because of Azusa. I am a Pentecostal tongue-talking, demon-casting Christian because there was a man called Pai Elton, one of your sons that came to our shores. He brought Jesus. And that's why we're here today on the soil of the United Kingdom. To bring Jesus back. Because since our ancestor, Pai Elton, brought Jesus, he brought the character of Jesus, he brought, he brought the power of Jesus. So we could do no less. So I had to resign my appointment. Because Jesus, the administrator, he says so. Because we were created by him. We were created, what? For him. And it was the design of the Father. In the chapter of the eternal purpose that he should be preeminent in all things. So the question is, is he preeminent in your life? Is the extent to which he has found his place of preeminence in your life that will characterize the potency of your prayer. There is an angulation, there is an alignment 
of the heart to that office that is in the spirit in order to bring the dimensions of God down. If you understood that, I think I can't go to my scripture anymore. Matthew 18. I think this is the lesson for the night. So we need to go into practicals. How to set your heart to his throne because the Bible says that we should come boldly to the throne of grace, to the place where grace is administered. It's an invitation to everyone that is in Christ Jesus. Come boldly. Come boldly. Do you come? Do you respond to the invitation on a daily basis? Come boldly. So we want to go to the throne of grace, that place where grace is found. That is the place where things that are about to die revive. That is the place where things that are lost are found. That is the place where things that are taken can be restored. I know that place. It's a place where my weakness is swallowed. My fears are swallowed. And the spirit of faith comes upon my heart. That is the place where my weakness is taken away. And it is exchanged for the spirit of power. Oh, if you know the place I speak of, there is nothing that is left for you to fear. I need to tell you my story before we round up. We went to a remote place to preach the gospel. So we put 5 p.m. on the publicity material. Meanwhile, the guys are farmers. It doesn't matter what is on your poster, on your flyer. They will start coming by 7. Whether you put 5 o'clock, 3 o'clock, that's for you. They will go to farm first. <laughs> so they, they all went to farm. And when they came back from the farm, there's something called pounded yam. Do you know yam here? Yam. Do you know yam? My white brothers, you, you know yam? Huh? All right. So there's a delicacy we call pounded yam. That's the real food from where I'm coming from, not mushrooms. I, I saw mushrooms and all. I had to pray. I said, Lord, help me. So I, I've not been in touch with pounded yam for some time since I came on this mission field. And if you're from Africa and you have not had pounded yam, you have not eaten. So for all the days I've been here, I have no it. <laughs> so these guys will go to the farm, come back from the farm, pound, pounded yam, and eat with okra soup. You know okra? Yes. And when you eat that, after laboring on the farm, you will sleep first. Yes. And then when they recover themselves from sleep, they will now say, we are hearing some sound. <laughs> so we prayed. We started opening prayer by five, and we prayed. Huh? And they were not coming. So I told my tour guide, I have a leading. Let's visit the shrine of the village. Meanwhile, don't do what I did. I was led. All right? Don't just wake up and get excited. Yeah? So it was not excitement. I was led to visit the shrine. And the shrine is where the strong man of the land is. The one that sacrifices blood to the 22 altars of the community. The most dreaded individual among men. And the Lord said, pay him a visit. So I told the my tall guy, do you know where the shrine is? They look at the shrine of the community. He said, yes, I was born here. Okay, let's visit the place. And when we were approaching, the guy had, the priest, he was 100 years old. I at the time I met him. I was 36 then. Okay, I was 36 years old then. That's a long time ago. He was 100 years old. And he had given blood to all the altars and the spirits were excited. And normally, if they accept his offering, they give him a song to sing. A song that is inspired by the demons. And so that song was on his lips when we, were, when we were coming. It means the spirits were agitated. They were excited at the offerings. And we were marching towards the, the place. And the man got interested. He turned around and said, Hey, who are you? Because he wasn't respecting anybody. He was most feared. Nobody visits, visits him. If you have someone that has problems, has trouble, you have someone that's mad, you want him to minister to the mad person, there is this unexplainable kind of sickness and you know that kind of stuff so he, he saw we were healthy we didn't need his help so he asked us hey who are you and i told my interpreter tell him we have come in peace he, he looked at us with suspicion peace only for him to realize that the spirits that were following him from the shrine had left <laughs> upon our arrival he wasn't as strong as he was when he was singing and he, he tried to threaten us. That is, and I told him clearly, if you don't put that your hand down, I will curse it and it will wither. 
So he, he looked for a, a smart way. I don't know how it's one way. And he, <laughs> he brought the hand up. He brought the hand up. Meanwhile, as, as all of these things were going on, I was connecting with Jesus. I said, can you reveal something about this man? And he told me, he has a chest condition that is 13 years old, chest pain. I said, oh, the demons you said, they were not able to heal you of your chest pain that is 13 years old. He said, you need a seat. <laughs> so he said that. And I was, I opened the scripture and began to talk to him. And then the nine elders that support him in his priesthood, old men with walking stick, they now came into the place. So I began to talk to them, my interpreter was interpreting. It was like for 30 minutes, 30 minutes. And they accepted Jesus Christ. And, and I insisted. I insisted that they, they should kneel down to accept Jesus. So they were kneeling. Accepted Jesus. I asked them to, for, to renounce the spirits of the altar. And they did. And I prayed for them. And blessed them. And prayed for his chest pain. And God healed him. Then I left him. Then we came down from the mountain top. By the time we got down from the mountain top, the people started attending. The people had slept, eating pounded yam all cross soup and now they were on the crusade ground it was about 10 p.m in the night and when we came to the crusade ground the witches in the territory never knew that the um, mast which was the altar was no longer powerful they didn't know that during the praise and worship people that were crippled started standing up from wheelchairs no preacher no preacher on the pulpit a man close to me stood up and he could not believe that he was was his legs so he, he touched them if he wants to look at me i will remove him. i don't know <laughs> there were three people that rose up from their wheelchairs without a preacher by the time i came my job was simple there was already evidence on ground that jesus could heal three plus ten okay ten other crippled people walked so when the witches saw that uh, the people that they had afflicted were walking free of affliction, they ran away from the crusade ground. We left our Bibles on the pulpit and we followed after them. <laughs> the deliverance continued till like 2 a.m. Yes. By 3 a.m. in the morning, the, the village was free of satanic power. <laughs> and that was not because we were strong. That was because we aligned to the source of power. You will live a small life if you don't know the office of this great Christ. For the Bible says, of the Father are ye in Christ Jesus. He is the fulcrum of our civilization. As New Testament believers. He's the one that has everything that the Father wants to give us in custody. So he is designed to be the most important personality in our lives. God himself has ordained that he should be preeminent. Oh my God. You know, an ordinary believer is different from a forgiving believer. You know that? You also know, do you also know that an ordinary believer is different from a consecrated believer? A believer that has come to understand that the meaning of my life is Christ. So I submit to his authority completely. From henceforth, he will stir my life in the direction of his pleasing. That's what makes you close to him. And when you cry, he will come and find out what, what troubles you. Just like he will come in a moment now. <laughs> he will walk through this place. I will tell you what he's doing. And those things will happen in the natural as a means of showing you the practicality that you can pray and see your prayers answered in seconds, in minutes. It takes seven seconds to hear the voice of God. If you're in the right place. Seven seconds. 